So thank you, Victoria, for the kind introduction. So our body consists of about 30 trillion different cells. Well, they're organized in organs. So like the lungs, the brain, the gut. Depending on the function, the cells have different shapes. So this is a neuron. So, and it helps us to perceive the world as it is. So, and there's lots of different cells in the brain, obviously, but when you go to other parts of your body, cells look vastly different. So the red blood cells are round and flexible and they transport the oxygen to every part of your body. Then there are cells that form barriers. So they keep the bad things out, keep the good things in. And in the case of our gut, they take up nutrients. So we want to talk about single cell genomics today. I will go to talk to show uh, and show you what is this about. And I will use the example of the gut. Well, the gut, it's not just a pipe that turns your food into feces while taking up the nutrients. It's a high performance organ. And what you see here on the left hand side are so called villi. And they extend and uh, increase the surface of your gut so you can take up even more nutrients. When you're on high fat diet, eat a lot of burgers, these villi are even larger. So taking up nutrients is really exhaustive. So, and uh, the cells that take up the nutrients, they die really quickly. And so they have to be refilled and replenished every four to five days, which makes up like a 200 grams of cells every day. So, and the cells that refill the gut and the surface of the gut are stem cells. They're tissue specific, they only form gut cells. They reside in a small protected area which is called a crypt and these, are, these crypts are located between the villi. So this is our green cells, they're stem cells. They produce all the different types of cells in the gut. They're supported by so-called pan of cells which also protect these cells and we have a couple of more cells that produce mucus or whose functions are even unknown to date. So, and I wanted to know how the stem cells actually form the different cell types. Well, for the gray cells that do all the nutrients take up job, that's already quite known, that's okay, but uh, for all the other cells, there's a lot of different competing models in the literature. I counted 12 last time I checked, I reduced this to two. So one would be we have some kind of not more stem cell like direct descendant of the stem cell that produces all different cell types. Or we have this model of direct lineage allocation it's called. So the stem cells directly decide what they want to be in the future and then become this cell type. All right. So how can we check what a cell is and how they're going to do this decisions, what they want to be? Um, I, I give you a bit of a metaphor for this. So imagine you have a doctor or you have a policeman. Obviously, they use different tools for their daily life. And the tools are different for the different professions, but they also share a set of tools because they all have to do paperwork or look at a, a computer. So once the tool's broken, you need a new one. And you order it as in a catalog. So you place an order and you get the delivery. It's as simple as that. As long as you have money, well, cells don't care about money. All right. And in order to get the right item, um, you place the correct catalog number. Okay. Cells do pretty much the same thing. They have DNA. DNA is their catalog. So, and what a cell need for a daily life, um, it orders with a molecule called mRNA. And it's similar as that, it gets a protein delivered and the proteins are the tools that the cells use in order to fulfill their function. Well, the mRNAs are all have also catalog numbers, which we call genes. So, and now to see how cells are working and which tools they use, we now look at all the mRNAs, all the orders a cell is placing. And with this, we can actually reveal what the cell is. So, and we can look at every cell one by one and see all the orders that they place at a certain time. So we take our gut, we single out all the, all the cells, and we put this into this nice machine that we can only see through the microscope because it's so tiny. 
So it's a called a microfluidic system, and all the tiny droplets that you see out passing through to the left-hand side, uh, right hand for you, um, these are nanoliter volumes. So what's a nanoliter? So imagine you take a teardrop, you split it by a thousand, and that's a nanoliter. And we shoot the cells into these small droplets, and we can analyze this. Um, using these droplets. So these are our reaction chambers where you can count the mRNA molecules. Well, we use working. let's go to next. <laughs> all right, so once we counted all the mRNA molecules, we end up with such a data table. So, and I'm a computer scientist, so this is where I actually start to work with. So every, say, every dot and pixel in this um, heat map um, is the number of mRNAs we counted per cell and per gene. So it's actually, yeah, we counted a lot. It's a huge data table. You don't want to see this in Excel. And now we want to make sense out of this. All right. We, and we use a process called uh, dimensionality reduction to group the cells into a 2D space. So, and this grouping is happening by so-called similarity. We place cells that are similar to each other, that have similar genes, um, we place close together, and cells that are dissimilar, we place on different edges of this map. Okay, well, the map is gray, and we see the edge structure. But where are our cells? Okay, in order to find our cells, we use something called clustering where we group again the cells together, and now we have more colorful plots here. And now having this grouping, we start to annotate our cells using so-called marker genes. So biologists have been looking at the gut for quite some time already, and they know already which genes are present in which cell type, and this is what they use to um, yeah, f find their, their favorite cell types again. All right. So, and then this is now how we can actually see, okay, we have this map, and we found our cells that we put in again. We can even characterize our cells further to see what's different between the cells, which genes are characteristic for each cell type, and which are more or less the same. So, genes are obviously, the, uh, so some cells, um, so actually, all the cells, they, they have to do some kind of housekeeping. So to keep the cell clean and healthy and fine, so they, they need the same tools for that, but they have also characteristic tools they use for their function. All right, yay, we have our cells. But what was the initial question? We have the stem cells, we want to know how the stem cells decide what they want to be. So can we answer this with that kind of uh, data analysis? I give you a bit of a different analogy for that. Yes, we can. So imagine you, when you were a kid, you had some kind of a flip book. Um, and when you flip over the pages, you see that there's uh, some incremental change. And even though the first and the last page of your flip book are fairly different, you saw a story developing. We can do the same thing with our cells. So we have our stem cell and we have our mature specialized cell. And we want to learn how these cells turn from one to the other. So this is what we want to see, but we don't have that really. We rather have a lot of cells that were drawn from the process. So now all we have to do is to define a starting point in our data, define an end, and find the neighbors so that we can reconstruct that path through the cells. And this is the math part that's difficult. I can talk about this in the break. What I tell you, that works. So here you see with the gray edges between all the cells, which cells are close to each other. And using now, um, so now we can use our path drawing tool to connect the stem cells with all the respective cell types. And what we can see and what we found mathematically is that the stem cells directly turn into the respective cell types and they have their personal direct descendant. Sorry, it's just that the mic is just starting to... 
drop. Sorry for that. All right. So what you can see, so from our data, we can actually support um, this direct lineage allocation model. So the stem cells directly decide what they want to be and how they want to look like in the future. So, but we can do more. We can even watch the cells grow up. So starting from the stem cell, here you see again a nice heat map and what's red is what's characteristic for these cells, for the stem cells. And what is in blue or even in gray, um, it's not expressed in the cells. And now we can start to, to walk along our path and see, okay, there's a cell that's uh, in an intermediate state where the cell starts to um, transition and we see that a couple of other genes are turned on that are characteristic for this transition state. And again, as the cell is now specializing, we see that the stem cell um, genes are turned off, they're now blue, and the characteristic um, genes for that mature cell types have been turned on. We can use these kind of processes to learn about the healthy state. We learned a lot about the healthy state already. And once we go to a disease state, where we see another cell type popping up and being vastly overrepresented, we can now learn losing, uh, using these tools what went wrong, when it went wrong, and how it went wrong. So I showed you a lot about the gut today, how cells mature, how they interact, how they grow. But there's more to a human than just the gut. Well, most certainly. And there's a couple of initiatives that want to learn now all about everything about all the other organs. So we want to create uh, a periodic table of cell types of the human and filling in the blanks for all the other cells and all the other organs. Within for inter, we concentrate on the brain, on the different cell types of the brain, how they interact, how they work, when, when things go wrong, how they go wrong. And once we've learned all these things, we aim to revolutionize medicine in the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very inspiring ending. Uh, let's see what kind of questions people have to your talk. There is one on the back, um, please. Thank you for this wonderful uh, talk with beautiful data. Um, and the idea by this periodic table, of course, is that in atoms, the atoms have a relationship to each other and it's also complete. Is that the same case with these, um, these cells, that the cells have a very clear relationship to each other and that this is somehow a complete map of all possible uh, cell, cell types? Sorry, the question was not clear, I guess. Yeah, can you rephrase? So I'll try, yeah. So with, with atoms, there is, um, the rows represent a, a yeah. sort of difference, right? And the columns represent a different difference yes. of the you know, ah, atomic right. nucleus. Is there something similar with uh, cells? They have a very clear uh, functional relationship to each other. So the question is that uh, does this kind of periodic table of cell types actually relate to the actual um, periodic table of yeah. elements? Um, I've been, I have been have been being asked this question already again uh, once. Like, all right. Um, so this is more like a conceptual figure. We so some cell cell types are really related to each other, and there is also a hierarchy of cells. Um, there's a bit of a discussion in the field to say what is a cell type. The closer you look, the less sure you are what it is. Um, we have also cells that gradually change from one cell type to the other, and there's some kind of intermediate state. So be assured there's a lot going on on this. Um, and we haven't even discovered all the cell types in our body. Yep, I hope that answers your question. At least it's very complex, that's what we mm -hmm. definitely understood. So maybe Karsten can talk to you more about this in the break, if he's really yes, curious. Yes, <laughs> Let's see if there are more questions. Uh, uh, I have one. Uh, okay. Thank, um, there, there thank you for thank you for the presentation. 
Uh, my question is when you say also um, these stem cell transfers into an immediate or another cell and send into the end stage. So what is the body or what we're doing with these intermediate cells? So what are they good for? So the question is what are the intermediate cells uh, once we go from one state to the other? Um, well, they're intermediate. They're, <laughs> they're not the one, not the other. It's like... Um, yeah, but what is our body doing with it? So it's... it's so it, it's like school, I would say. Oh. <laughs> you, don't, you don't stay in school forever unless you're a teacher. No, no, but, but not to be honest, so um, you basically, the cells are educated, so they have to change and they change their shape and their, their function and uh, in this transition state, they basically, yeah, have to turn into the other part. Okay, so, that, so until they function fully then basically. Yeah, the end exactly, okay. so they have to establish their function. Thank you. Thanks, there was one question here in front. It, it's, a, it's a related question. I'm just wondering how, how you synchronize your cells. Because there's going, like, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, gene expression is a dynamic event. And so how are your cells, like, of the different cell types actually synchronized? How do you know they're all in the same place? OK, so the question is how cells, uh, how the cells are synchronized? Genetically. Like, Genetically. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, genetically, they're all the same, and we take in vivo samples. But, so but the mRNA expression is dynamic, right? Yes. So how do you know that they're all, like, yeah, they're the same cell type, but how are they synchronized for gene expression? That's a very elaborate question. So um, there's one point, gene expression is bursty. So you have a bit of an expression, then it's off, and a bit of an expression, then it's off again. Um, and we average over the, all the single cells. So we get signal for every single cell, and then we group them together and look at these groups again to be sure. So you do it like in post, kind yes, of, not, not before you harvest or anything. Like you basically no. get the data and then do it by analysis. Yes, we do okay. it by analysis. That's the beauty of it, because you can use organs and just patient samples for this. You don't have to put them, process them in the lab to synchronize them in order to get your signals, you can just take patient samples. So hopefully we'll do this in the future, just take a single cell sample, se sequence it, and get the result immediately. I yeah. hope so. Okay. So let's take all the other questions to the break, and now thank Maren. Thank you very much.